So my name is Deborah Pierce, and I'll take the brief time of the wild sensor standby. Is it better? Yeah. Better? Not good? Okay, should I love it? Um. So, just a quick little bio, because we were the standby and the folks who were um, uh, sick. So, I'm an attorney, I'm a privacy advocate, I was quite lucky my first job out of law school was for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And after I was there for a few years, I, I left and started up my own nonprofit. Uh, focusing on consumer privacy issues, and that was called Privacy Activism. And now I'm moving on to another project um, with John Pickett's, and that is the Tapestries, which we hope is a diversity, diversity friendly social network. And so, since we're working on that, we decided we wanted to talk about um, diversity friendly social networks, others that we have encountered. Uh, John, my background is a software engineer. Static analysis, security, I was at Microsoft Research for several years, done a lot of uh, blogging about diversity in technology and diversity in online source. Also done a lot of activism, uh, including on social networks. Let's start by talking about just what we mean by uh, diversity from the social networks. And this is this is a, such a small session. Please feel free to jump in at any point. We can make this as interactive as, as you want. And, uh, I, I really think of the uh, two different aspects of, of the diversity framework. One is just, well, have, having diverse participation there across multiple dimensions. And I think you have to think about all the different dimensions of diversity, gender, age, race, and then also the more the, the subtler ones, uh, expertise, political orientation, all of these things are places where you want a more diverse network has more viewpoints. Now, obviously, no social network is going to be diverse across all the different dimensions. So even if we look just at gender, though, you can see that there's a huge range in how diverse most social networks are. And you're never going to get perfection. But I think it's safe to say that some of these ones down here on the bottom, which are 70% plus mail, the GitHub, Stack Overflow's hacker news in the world, that's not diverse participation. Now when you get into something like Facebook, that's clearly diverse since, since most people are on Facebook, it tends to mirror the demographics of the uh, country as a whole. But I'd say there's this other aspect of diversity friendly that they're not as good at. And that's, that's the part of actively seeking out and promoting diversity. Um, an example of a, a, of a site that's, that's just great at that would be Dreamwith. And if, you, if you look at their diversity statement, I think this really gets at both the complexity and, and the value these, these are just some excerpts of it. But if you look at how broadly they cast and how, how broadly they describe the diversity, the usual aspects, but also things that you know, neurotype, family structure, culture and subculture, things that it's, it's easy to, to overlook, particularly if you start with a relatively homogenous group. And we also, I think, have a great statement of the value of diversity. And for, for the West Bridge, we didn't put in the slide saying why diversity. But, you know, in terms of why diversity on social networks, what, what we see is happening in general is, yeah, everybody's on Facebook, but Facebook's not where the action is. And, and as things are, are moving apart, there's going to be more and more independent, niche social networks, people building their own social networks. And these are a chance to start them from, from a fresh start with a much more diversity-friendly focus. And some examples of, that we use of our diversity from these social networks. Dream with, of course, it started as a live journal fork, uh, but very diverse community from the beginning. Gender Overflow, uh, question and answer site focused on gender issues, started at TransHack. Um, free association, that we'll be talking about that later. Small privacy and civil liberties for, for the social network. I'm curious, are there other things that people would put on the list of diversity friendly? Social networks. I don't know if this is like a little early to bring this up or not, you might be getting into it later, but um, something that I, I think is really, to me, not ideal about Facebook and that kind of model is because you have this kind of like algorithmic selection done on your behalf of what you see. There's a lot of confirmation bias. And I feel like um, in, uh, in forums that are more like, um, I want to say like, something like a, uh, something like Slashdot, where you have like, kind of like an article-based thing. I was thinking the, the more traditional forums, yeah, like, where you like just forms everything, and you 
can make your own decisions. Yeah. Um, it, give, you, you get to see a broader range of viewpoints. Now, of course, Slashdot by the same token was always criticized for the right, thing. Right. You get to see right. 47 different but, people yeah. saying how bad Microsoft is. But right. yeah. But yeah, it's like they're, they're, one of the things we'll talk about is how the technology of the site actually impacts the diversity. Mm -hmm. And such some of the uh, some of the other properties that we'll talk about. The, the bulk of the presentation will be going down into these, so I'm not going to uh, go over them in any detail. But it's you know as, as we were just talking about Slashdot, you know, no site is going to be perfect on all of these different attributes, um, and yet pretty much any site can improve on one or more of these attributes to become more diverse. So, amongst the most more important things are the attitude and the norms of the founders and the early adopters and the influentials. And you can see that in some of the, um, you know, statement that you just put up there for Dream With. Um, it has that whole big list and, you know, that really does show that their values were baked into the social network from the very beginning. And, you know, you really want that. When you look at a, a company like Facebook, um, you know, it was started by a very homogenous group of people at an elite college, and those values were baked into that social network, and you see those values projected even today with a lot of the policies that they have on data sharing and, and privacy. Um, also important are the community guidelines. Now this is different than a traditional terms of service, you know, which has a lot of the, the legal things that you have to have, you know, such as no child porn, no spam, and there are specific ways of, of writing those policies and you have to have those. But community guidelines, that's a better way to, to really get at the values that you want to project into your social network. Um, and again, you know, Dream With is one. But this little snapshot is from the Association, which is a, a very tiny, fairly defunct social network that we had started, well, me and some other people had started, um, uh, you know, in 2005. And it was a spin-off of Tribe.net, which is not a social network. But Tribe had, had and has a very diverse population because, again, it was built in at the very beginning. So you had, you know, the Burning Man culture. You had the side trans brave people there. You had, um, you know, very gay friendly spaces. Um, and so, you know, Free Association kind of jumped off because they wanted to do some different things. So it was on the steering committee there. And so we were trying to figure out how do we create a diverse population there. And we flailed around for a while. What do we do? How do we do this? So there's a process. You have to have a process. It doesn't, you know, diversity doesn't just happen. So eventually we hit upon this idea that we would have a constitutional convention because, hey, the founders, so <laughs> probably work for us too. And so what we did was we kind of seeded this little group area with some statements that we thought would not be controversial, like, okay, you know. Here's this policy, here's that policy. And we opened it up to everybody on the site. You know, it's like draft your own, put in the, the ones that you think are important, and at the end of it all, we'll, we'll vote on them. The ones that, that we decide make it into our constitution, we'll keep the ones that don't get voted on, that get voted down, we, we won't have. So, for example, it's not in this little snapshot, but you know, diversity being accessibility as well. Um, some people wanted to have little flashy wiki GIF files in their signature files. And so you know, that's an issue for a lot of people. And so we had a long discussion about it. The thread probably had you know, 20, 30 posts in it, you know, pro and con. And eventually we voted on it. And everyone decided, you know, it probably isn't a great idea to have flashy wiki things in your SIG file. And so that's not part of the Constitution. And we did that for each and every one of those things that you see. Everybody voted, and you know it was a kind of a long process. And you know eventually we came up with the constitution and we put it all together, and then voted on that. You know, do we accept this document? And we did. And so you know the benefit of all of that was we ended up with 
a program that that really appealed to a lot of people and took all of their values into account, not just the steering committee saying, you know, here's what we think is the way and this is the only way. And so we yeah, thought that was good. That was an example of that dream like we said, had a, had a different way of going about that. But you know, you can be creative. You can come up with any number of ways to make sure that you bake in the diversity that you want for your social network. And one really important aspect is just having having policies against harassment and against hate speech. And, and having the policies isn't enough. They also have to be enforceable. You know, some good examples of this, uh, Django's Code of Conduct, which similarly came out of a bunch of discussions within the community, Mozilla's uh, Code of Conduct. A lot of these are modeled after conference Code of Conducts, like the ones we've all got in our, our lanyard. And it's come about for, for similar purposes. The best practices for these are to be, to be very specific about the kinds of behaviors that are and aren't permitted. Um, and you have to make sure that there, you've got a process associated with it. Because the policy, some, at some point, somebody's going to violate the policy. Then what do you do? You can't just say, oh, well, that's too bad. You have to have a documented process to go, to go through. But a counterexample of a place where the policy by itself isn't enough if you don't have it enforced and, and, and reinforced by everybody is Quora. Quora is a question and answer site. Uh, um, and their, their, their policy is be nice, be respectful. Let's say. They use this so much it's abbreviated, BNPR. Um, a few months ago, one of the Quora executives asked uh, on Quora, you know, what are the issues that women face on this site? Because it's, it's very primarily male. Uh, and wow. You know, the usual horror stories come up, people getting harassed. You can ask questions anonymously on Quora, and gosh, a whole bunch of women found that they were getting anonymously asked really sexist questions, particularly the most prominent feminist women there. And the list goes on. It's not clear that it's substantially worse than other, than other male-dominated sites, but it's not better. The, the be nice, be respectful policy, too vague, not enforced enough, people and you've got your intentional bad actors, and then you've got the ones who just don't know what being nice really means in practice. And also very important to um, a, a diversity-friendly social network is privacy. And you know, it's, it's important for the reasons that we say. You know, um, you know, it's got a, if you don't have privacy on a particular site, the burden is on marginalized groups, women, LGBTQ folks, kids, survivors of various kinds. Um, and you know, coupled with that, you know, social networks are about sharing. I mean, you're, if you're going to get involved in a group discussion, invariably you're going to end up posting personal information about yourself. But, you know, on one hand you can, you know, do I really want to post this? You know, be, being sure, you know, that old adage of, you know, do you want that information that you just posted to be shown on the front page of the New York Times above the fold? Are you okay with that? If you are, post away. You know, if not, you might want to think a little bit more about that. But then there's, you know, when you have an expectation that where you're posting is private and it's not going to be shared with a lot of people, and then all of a sudden it is, you know, sort of like Facebook's policies where it's like, oh, no, this is a private space, and then it isn't. That is something else, and then you, you just don't know. And so, you know, there's all these gotchas that happen. That if they had a consistent policy, what's private stays private, what public stays public, you wouldn't have so many gotchas. I mean, I think that's one of the benefits of Twitter. You know, it's all public. That's the default. You know, you can have little private areas, but you know, for the most part, it's all out there, and you know that going in that this is a, a public thing. Um, but really, you need to be able to feel confident that there's a consistent policy and that it's easy to use, that you have privacy controls, that you know how to use, that you don't get tripped or confused by them, and that you have easy ways of just saying, nope, I don't want to share any more information. I'm making my profile private, and that's the way it is. And the ways of doing that are fair information practices. And I'm just going to get pedantic just for a moment. Um, but in this country, we have five prongs for fair information practices. They are notice, choice, access, security, and redress. And what that is, for notice, it's knowing that, you, that 
there is a privacy policy. You can find it, you can read it. It's written in clear language. Um, it's not written in legalese that only a few people can read, not everybody can read. Choice being opt-in and opt-out. Opt-in being the more privacy protective of the, of the choice. Opt-out, which is pretty much everybody, that if you don't want your data being used in a particular way, you say no, as opposed to them having to ask you first. And then access, information that's being collected about you, that you have some way of seeing that information. If the information is incorrect, that you have some ability to correct it. Security, you know, obviously security is hugely important, um, particularly after things like heartbeat and all of that. I mean, you want to know that the site that's collecting all this very personal information about you is protecting it. And then if they aren't, there's some kind of redress that there's a process, there's a procedure that if you've been harmed in some way, you have some way of making it better. In other countries, they use the OECD guidelines and some other, some other privacy practices, but they're generally stronger. The OECD guidelines, there's eight of them, and they're much more detailed than this. But the one that I, that I will just mention is no secondary uses. And I believe that you know, if we did that in this country, you, you, the vast majority of privacy issues would just not even happen. Because, you know, to use as an example, Facebook again, you know, you have an avatar that you use you know, for your profile photo. You know, here's, here's a picture of John Bates. And I go to that profile, okay, that is the John Bates I'm looking for. There's the photo I recognize him. So that's all good. That, that's what the, the information was used for. Originally, that's why it was collected. Now Facebook is using it as, you know, for sponsored ads. So his photo might show up in an ad for some product that he doesn't like or doesn't want to have anything to do with. That's a secondary use. So if you prohibited secondary uses, those sponsored ads would just go away. They would need to be an issue. And then just looking at notice and choice and the, and the rest of the, the fair information practices, even, even though they're, they're diluted from the OECD guidelines, even here, companies don't use all of them. Like I just read um, an op-ed over the weekend by a marketer, and he was going on about, well, why do we need privacy? It's not important. And hey, you know, we use notice and choice. You know, like this was a big deal. But really, he's diluting it the fair information practices even more than they already are. So you know, we're not doing a great job protecting that information. Okay, um, on the, the previous slide, um, there's something I've heard about being fairly common in Europe about a, a right to be forgotten. Is that something mm -hmm. that's part of the, the OECD? That's a separate issue. Is it? Um, you know, and that was just, I think just in the last several months, they adopted that. There was a rule. Oh, right. Yeah. That said that you can do that, and you know, obviously it's very controversial because you know who has the right to be forgotten and right. where. Right. You know, so do politicians have a right to be forgotten? I would argue no. You know, it's like we need to know what public officials are saying and what their beliefs are, so we know how to vote. And right. whereas you know, kids, you know, under eighteen, they're just posting you know whatever, you know, and then when they become adults. You know, it's like, oh my god, here's this thing that I said when I was a kid, I was stupid, I didn't mean it. You know, they should be able to have that expunged, you know, so it doesn't follow them around for the rest of their lives. It's a great example, though, of where the European views of privacy are just so different from the American views. We were just at the uh, Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference, and you know, when you talk to people in the U.S., they say, oh, I have to be forgotten. This is clearly nonsense. It's like, you can't, you, you know, once it's out on the web, you can't forget it. It's like, well, you can make it harder to act. And when you talk to people from Europe, they base it in, well, this may be difficult to implement, there may be challenges, it may be imperfect, but, but really people do have this fundamental right to have, you know, to control the information about themselves. And it's just this fascinating difference in philosophy. Right. And also in Europe, they actually pay a lot more attention to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has a right to privacy to go right into it. And a lot of Europeans regard privacy as a fundamental whereas we don't. So you just get that, that big difference. Have you seen any, any um, implementations in, uh, in software of that kind of policy that you consider to be like effective for the scope of which they're, like, they're outstanding examples of, of good 
I mean, with regard to social networks. Um, or or it's it's any sort of like like social, yeah, social networking well, I mean, kind of social I, context. I, I have. Um, you know, it's you know, people talk to people talk to us all the time about to privacy. I think it's not just me, but mm -hmm. you know, to the privacy rights clearinghouse, to the ACLU, to you know, a whole bunch of different groups, the FS. And you know, like they'll they'll come to us with a privacy policy and say, Is this okay? You know, and they'll work with us, mm -hmm. you know, which is great. And you know, even Tribe, you know, their founders talk to me about their privacy policy. And at this point, I think their privacy policy is pretty I, I, would, I would talk more specifically about like a right to be forgotten. Like it's, it's one of those things that's hard to get so off. Right? Like, so kind of, like, so, kind of so legal, Google's initial implementation of that is you, you have at the first level it's not unreasonable. You have to submit a request to be taken out of the Google database. Then you get to well, how do you know that you're actually the person submitting your request? So right, right now you have to include your government issued ID as part of the request. Huh. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if 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 there's a question about it, it then gets kicked over to the data protection. Uh, right regime. It's not clear how much will you need a lawyer to navigate through the process. It's still too new to really know. I, think. I don't think we know at all yet how it's actually going to be implemented. Um, and that brings us to pseudonymity, which I view as a subset of, of privacy. Um, you know, just being able to call yourself whatever you want to call yourself on on a particular social network. You don't have to use your name. Um, real names can be quite harmful. Um, we had the slide earlier showing, you know, how different groups are harmed when they don't have enough privacy. So, you know, women, LGBTQ folks, kids, etc. Um, and Google Plus just had that big debacle with their real names policy and the bid wars and all of that. And just recently, there was this woman, this, this transgender woman, who um, was harmed by. Um, a new implementation of, of Google's KitKat um, technology, where her two two profiles, one that was relatively pseudonymous and one that had a real name, they were linked together. And so they outed her to her co her coworkers. And she wasn't ready to be outed yet. So you get that tweet, you know, so now she's freaked out about it, you know, because of the technology that they just didn't think about the ramifications of what would happen they link those two profiles together. One of the reasons that, uh, that pseudonymity really relates so closely to diversity is that uh, on, on most internet sites, women are harassed far more than men. It's like a factor of five or six. It's shown up in several different media. Uh, um, so unsurprisingly, many, many women want to choose gender neutral, gender -neutral names. Huge issue in the gaming world. Well, still, you know, pseudonymity by itself doesn't make the harassing problems go away, which leads us to you know, the technologies that, that really let people protect themselves, protect themselves and others from harassment. Um, you know, muting and blocking people. So blocking just means preventing somebody from contacting you, or prevent, and preventing somebody from seeing what you're doing. And this isn't going to stop a determined stalker, but so much online abuse is the sort of casual microaggression, drive-by nastiness that that just decent tools for this is really helpful. And this is something that, you know, as a technologist, it, it, it's, I find it very frustrating because this is not so hard to do reasonably well. And there's subtleties, there's things you can do wrong, but but if you look at most sites, they don't even do the basics of it. In fact, December last December, Twitter, which has a pretty mediocre implementation to begin with. They even tried to take a step back and uh, and take away even some of those protective tools. I think what's going on is that in general, the people who run these sites are not have not had the experiences of being abused and harassed, and it doesn't really strike them how common this is. Um, of course, you know, for the determined people, just these casual things aren't enough to stop it. So you also need to have a process for reporting people, filing a complaint. Google Plus, rather incredibly, launched and got to a couple million people without having any process to report bad behavior. Uh, I just didn't think of that. And then the companies have to follow up with that. Um, just to, on that example, I actually, a friend requested that I report a tweet that had an obvious death threat in it that they received out of nowhere. And the process I had to go through, I think, is kind of informative to your point. 
um, the process in the app after clicking record, it took me away from the tweet and I got a completely different screen so I lost all the information that was connected with it. I had to fill out a form with about 15 different things on it. When I finally finished it, and it was obvious to me, so it was an obvious death threat, I sent it, and then I got an email five minutes later saying, oh, sorry, we can't do anything because you weren't already involved in this. Exactly, right. It, it's, it's, um, it's almost like they don't care. No, I mean, it's not that they don't care, it's that they, they at the individual level, but it, it creates this corporate structure where they don't care. You know, if we were giving this talk a year or two ago, I probably would have listed Twitter as a diversity friendly social network. Because from a participation aspect, it's great. I mean, you know, most minorities are overrepresented on Twitter. It's, you know, because you can do it so well on a phone, it's great from a class perspective. But now it's become this very hostile environment. And so many diversity advocates are just having to take down their, uh, their Twitter page because there's too much abuse. It's like, what do you do when you do that? Um, one other question I had about this as well. Is do you think that this could be solved simply by added, by if we were to change the paradigm from uh, opt out to opt in? So it feels like with a lot of this, these unwanted like harassment comes from like, well, you've already opted into being connected with people, so they can already connect with you. Right. Well, I, I think I think that's a good point. I also think there's a question of what kind of interactions do you have with somebody when you're not connected with them. So, and and, and this is a tricky balancing. You, you've got to, on the one hand, this is part of what makes Twitter so wonderful that, oh wow, it's somebody I don't even know and I can tweet at them and I'll often get a response back so you can meet new people. On the other hand, you also want to be able to say, no, I don't want people I don't know tweeting at me. Or I want to somehow filter the people who are tweeting at me. And this kind of levels of, of really protection and control, these nuanced things are all very important. You know, DreamWick is a site that does this extremely well. It's like if you look at their privacy controls, it breaks down not in the same way that Facebook has this very granular tweaking all the different buttons, but it adds up to you're not safe. It, it, they've, they've thought much more intentionally on treatment about what kinds of things you do and don't want to allow. And speaking of, of, of things that are not impossible technolo technologically, in fact, are relatively well understood technologically. What sites don't do is accessibility. It's e easy for a bunch of able bodied people to sit around and, and, and completely forget how important accessibility is. If, if people can't, can't use your site effectively, they're not included. So, this, this includes support for the assistive technologies like screen readers and support for keyboard only navigation, as well as the subtle issues like uses of color and contrasting color for people who have different kinds of color blindness. There's good standards out there, uh, Aria, MCAP. Most sites don't don't adhere to even the even the minimums of this. There's, there's too many other examples to list to single out uh, any one place. But a subtle point is uh, self-identification. You're on a social network because you want to interact with people, and that means giving people an idea of who you are. And one of the common ways we like to do this are the typical demographic attributes like gender, race, orientation. This is, this is how we often think of ourselves and others. Not always. So, so point one is this all really needs to be optional. Many sites make this mandatory. And you know, sometimes you just don't want to say. Um, again, this is something when you go back to women being harassed more often online, that's one reason not to say. But another reason may just be, well, that's not how I want people's first impression of me to be. To restrict it only to my friends, perhaps. And then, even to the extent we do want to fill it out, to allow it to be much more flexible. And the gen world of gender is much more complex than male, female, other. It's even more complex than male, female, transgender, other. Not all transgender people are the same. Facebook has actually done some positive things here. They've, they've introduced uh, about 50 something different categories that you can choose from on your uh, gender. Uh, pull down, you can go even farther, and that, that still is saying, well, you're buying into their classifications, what if I don't fit into any of those? And so really, I think the answer here is gender as a text field. This is something Sarah May had learned for Diaspora, which is their architect. Sarah Dobbs got a lot of uh, good backstory uh, to just look at the kinds of subtleties that are important. And, you know, not just gender, um, race, orientation, all of these are things that about this, these are things that we're probably not comfortable in all cases disclosing to the world as a whole, 
And when we do disclose, we, you know, there are times when we do want to disclose. I want to find other people of, of my tribe considered broadly, and sharing this information helps build trust if I can share it on my own terms. Again, yeah, technically not so hard. Just make it a text field. But in practice, almost nobody implements in that way. And that leads us well into a, a user bill of rights. And we talked about this um, a long time ago, actually. We, on Free Association, we came up with it with an idea for it seven years ago. And then in 2010, at the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference um, that you chaired, we spent the week um, in various sessions coming up with a user bill of rights. And it was a very contentious process, particularly over issues of pseudonymity. But you can see uh, they're, they're much lengthier than that. We just took the keywords out of each of them. But they cover the gamut of, of everything that we've talked about today and more. Um, you know, the, the, the right to appeal. You know, if, if you have been blocked or banned from a social network, you should be able to have a right to appeal that decision to somebody, you know, and have a decision come back to you. And if you want to leave the social network, that you should be able to take your data and leave. And, you know, that it should be portable. If I don't want to be on Facebook anymore, I want to be on, you know, something else, that I should be able to get that information and take it with me. Um, so, you know, again, and we, had, we had a lot of people in that room. We had, we had lawyers, we had policy people, we had technologists, we had activists, we had a lot of activists. Um, so, you know, it kind of it went through um, a good a good um, assessment you know, while we were there. Um, and there, there are several drafts floating out there. If you go just, you know, search on Bill of Rights, you'll find, you know, 10 different versions. The, the core of them are that. And I think that, you know, having something like this, you know, that goes with your community standards, um, is, a, is a great way of empowering all of your members um, and users of your site. Because again, tying it back to diversity, it's like freedom of speech. Who's free, whose speech is going to be clamped down? Well, it's, it's the people who are not in the mainstream group. If you look at all of these, they, they tend to have a strong diversity implication. So summing up, you know, diversity doesn't just happen. It, it, it starts with intent, and the policies, processes, and technologies you have all, all matter. Did, did you have a question? Oh, no. You know, going back over the, the properties, as Deborah says, it really starts with the attitude and the norms from, from the people starting the society, the, the early adopters, and the people who set the tone, and then everybody follows along with that. That by itself isn't enough. You've got to entrench it in the guidelines and, and look at and, and consider these issues. And you know, it's 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 you, you can't be perfect. It's very difficult to be perfect on all of these. But you can have an environment where you're good and steadily improving on all these different dimensions. And improvements on any of them tend to be very synergistic. As 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 you get better on each front, you attract people who, who value diversity, and you create a self-reinforcing cycle. So thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Yeah, so you, you've all talked a little bit about uh, pseudonymity, and when I tend to think about that problem that exists on social networks, I, I tend to think of it as a problem because there seems like there's a tension between accountability and anonymity, and I feel like maybe that the answer to that is actually a function of what the actual social group is that's using that. So you might have a social group that really values anonymity and they need that because they're in like, China and they're like trying to talk about some activist goal or something like that. But then you might be in another group that's working for the US government and you need everyone to be very accountable for the action that they take on that. Um, so I'm just wondering what. Right. I mean, and, and, you know, we've, we've encountered that a lot in our community. Like where I come from, I'm not on Facebook. And so, you know, it's kind of a problem. And one of the things that really helps is um, having strong moderation tools, you know, so that, you know, you're in a particular group and maybe that group there just kind of wild and, you know, what, whatever you want to say goes. But then you might have a more constrained group. And so having moderators who have 
a variety of tools to you know keep the peace in these various places. That seems to help a lot. And I, I think there's a, there's there's a, there's an agreement of uh, options. So you can have pseudonymity that's that's pierceable with the right to option. So an example of this would come up with uh, well, imagine a site uh, like a couch surfing or something where you're actually staying in somebody's home. Would you be willing to stay in somebody's home without knowing their legal name? Um, maybe yeah, probably. But what about what about if they're, you know, like where there are issues? It's like if somebody's had serial bad behavior, or even one bad example, how do you hold them legally accountable? Well, this is probably a place where there's enough other information around that you can disambiguate who they really are enough to hold them accountable. Um, I'm I'm pretty. Fervently pro pseudonymity in general. I think, uh, I mean, I certainly intellectually believe there can be cases where the value of accountability outweighs the value of, uh, of, of pseudonymity, but in practice, I think it's very hard to find that other than the You know, even in, even in work contexts, we, we very often go by a professional name, which may not be the same as. as and in all of these cases, the burden that you try to uh, restrict it tends to fall on the people who are marginalized. Like uh, people who have names of a single, single, with a single word, they just get totally messed over by these policies. And it's hard to craft something that really allows that. But yeah, uh, when, when we when we uh, had several public debates on the, uh, like the Bill of Rights and the pseudonymity question is always the one that, that sparks the most debate. Good opinions on both sides. I am bringing it up because that actually happens a lot at my workplace because we allow people to create social networks. For us, your full name is just text field, you can put whatever you want on it. But then when someone creates a, a social network like their classroom, they're like, oh, well, I need to be able to identify every single person in this classroom. If they're going to use this, they need, it needs to be enforceable that it's their real name. And it's like, well, we don't do that. Right, right. I mean, it's, it's um, so you, you, you could convince me that that's. That's a, that's a situation where right? you, you do need to know people's real names. And uh, um, I, 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 so I think it's very good. Can you recap what I remember reading about? Can you recap what happened in Twitter in December with the blocking? Yeah. Um, so Twitter's current. Uh, I can't remember exactly the terminology they use. Uh, um, your current policy basically makes it so that uh, the other person can't see your posts and can't comment. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. So they, they still can see your posts if they're public. They can't contact you or they can't follow you. So they can't directly see your stream. But if they do a search, they can see those posts. And Twitter thought that, well, you know, since people can see the posts anyhow, there's, there's no real protection made by making it harder for them. So they also allowed you to be followed. You couldn't prevent somebody from following you. And it sparked enough of a debate that, that they wound up rolling it back. I remember, I think, some of their, their thought on it was that they didn't want the person who was being blocked to possibly know that they were blocked. Right. It's, 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 it's a tricky situation um, that, you know, in, in some cases that, um, that just sort of infuriates the, the, the person when they discover that they're being blocked. Um, and yet, I think what's interesting is they didn't really talk a lot with um, the people who, uh, who were going to be affected. So, so this is a, a post by, I think, Leigh Honeywell, which is um, extremely good. I think we linked to this from our description of the talk. Uh, right. Ah, uh, yes, so, so here we go. We'll have block users to continue to follow their targets and to interact with their targets' content by retweeting and favoring it. I think those are having bigger impact even because if you're harassing someone and you retweet the things that you, and your followers, Right, right, uh, um, right, and, and you're exactly right. They were trying to solve 
the problem of users being retaliated for blocking. Um, but but in a, their attempt to solve that, they created this other bigger problem. So the, yeah, that just gets back to what you were saying about they know what they think they know and they're not the ones who are doing Right, right, right. And I mean, again, it's like they, uh, they made this change without announcing, you know, without announcing it, without consulting it. And so um, when, when you, all this stuff is very fraught. There's, there's no obvious answers, and so when you do it, then catch people by surprise. That leads to a lot of distrust. I'm kind of curious about um, the partial because we're working on the captures. That was great. So, okay. We only have like five minutes left. Yeah, yeah, sure. We're going to move to the bridge, so I'm just going to breathe. So, Diversity friendly, uh, you know, I'd say our goal is to have something that's diversity friendly and privacy friendly. We don't think that that by itself is is the answer enough to get people to use it. Uh, um, particularly on privacy friendly, the world is riddled with the uh, corpses of, of social networks that give that are strong on privacy and never got enough adoption. So also really trying to go for a different, very fluid visual style to allow a lot more customization than most sites have, which is also an aspect of diversity. You know, it's, it's not up there on the other list, but I personally, you know, this is my site, I, I like pink. <laughs> I am so tired of every social network having blue as their <laughs> network. Um, I understand not everybody feels that way, so having pink be the default here would not actually be the right answer. Um, but you know, gi giving uh, giving giving the ability for people to uh, to customize things like um, you know colors, fonts, backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, and then also I think um, you know to really integrate chat and, and as as a full fledged uh, participant along with discussion networks to support support both the long form discussions and the shorter form status and photo kinds of things. Uh, there, there's, you know, it's very hard to come up with a site right now that where both of those feel natural. Um, you know, Facebook is not well set up for doing anything. You know, the technology vaguely supports it, but you wouldn't use it that way. Conversely, Dream with, you could post, you could use it just for status and things, but nobody does. It wouldn't feel right. So, so to get that kind of uh, kind, of, kind of kind of sense, we're, we're still you know we've had it. Wants to uh, check it out, more than happy to have you. Um, I mean, we've had it up for several months with a small group of, of people testing and uh, trying out the technologies. Um, Are you guys trying to grow at this point, or is this still kind of a work in progress? Uh, I'd say it's a work in progress. We're trying to lightly promote it. This is this is the first time we've even semi publicly uh, spoken about, it. and I think it, you know probably by the fall we'll be trying to promote it more actively. And do sure, perhaps or something. Thank you very much. Thank you.